क्या पढ़ा Checking if I'm audible. Vinay, can you confirm? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Shall we get going, Vinay? Vinay, if you can hear me, can we get going? Yeah. Just, uh, we are waiting for a few uh, participants.
Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah. Pinay, am I audible? Can you see my screen? Yes, 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 yes. Are you getting my voice? Hello. Yes. Yes, we can see. Shall we start? Uh, we are having only uh, six participants. Uh, shall we wait for two minutes? Okay. Uh, so yes, uh, we can start now. We are having uh, ten participants now. Actually, it's three and five. So uh, yes, uh, let's uh, join others. Uh, I, I want to introduce. Uh, Binay, yes. Are you getting my voice? Where are you located? Can't hear anything. Hello. Arindam, can you hear me? Other now I can. Okay. Now I can. Okay. Uh, not so clear. Your voice was not clear. One. Okay. Is it clear now? Arindam, shall we start? Hello. Can other participants confirm that my voice is clear? Anyone? 
Yes, it's clear. Yes, yes, your voice is clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are starting the time. Oh, okay. So Vinay is saying, am I audible? Can you all hear me? Just a thumbs yes, up. Yes, yes. Or... Yes, pretty okay. clear. Okay. Pretty clear. Excellent. Uh, Excellent. So, all right. So actually, I will start with... Uh... Arindam, actually, yes, I want Vinay. to introduce uh, about you and... Uh, about oh, that's day. okay. We can... It's already late. It's 10 minutes. You can introduce okay, okay. me later. You know, they know, oh. uh, you know... They can go to the oh. website and check. It's fine. Oh, Let's okay. Start. Okay. So, okay, okay. You can start. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, multiplicative reasoning, and uh, I take it as a you know a session where we will get a lot to discuss and talk about. And I will be leaving some of the uh, you know some of the ideas quite uh, recently developed, not by me but uh, by a group mainly in, based in Oxford University Education Department, uh, with whom I'm closely linked, and uh, that's the idea that I'm going to propose and present before you. And I'm hoping that we will have more you know, time for uh, conversation here. I, my name is Arindam Bose, and I'm a, a, one of the members on the faculty of uh, CETE, Center for Excellence in Teacher Education in TISS, Bombay. Uh, my areas of specialization are mainly in mathematics education, and that too at out-of-school knowledge of mathematics and uh, language diversity in maths education and so on. All right, so with that brief uh, introduction, uh, this is what I'm planning to do in the next half an hour or so, and then we'll open up for discussion. Please also stop me in between if you think you have pertinent questions or you know, comments to make. Uh, we are going to briefly talk about mathematical processes because they are connected, connected to actually what we are going to discuss, which is uh, going to be more about, you know, manipulatives and connections uh, or relation between numbers and quantities, then different pedagogic contexts that uh, will evolve, which we would be referring to, particularly to build up the idea of multiplicative reasoning. And uh, towards the end, I will give you some examples from Click's proportional reasoning module, if I am able to go there, and then I have the floor open for discussion. Now, the assumption about mathematics that we all have generally and also present in the curricular documents is to look at the entire subject, the entire experience of mathematics, which we try to offer to our students, is to have a domain of investigation. In fact, there are many critical theorists uh, drawing from Paulo Freire's critical theory uh, have framed this idea as landscape of investigation landscape of investigation so it's like a platform that mathematics uh, learning offers to students or anyone uh, who is using mathematics to be able to critically evaluate to make decisions to make and take decisions very judiciously uh, and also to move towards uh, seeing the world and interpreting the world in a way which brings forth uh, correct or 
you know, to the extent possible, mathematically correct. Now that is also debatable, of course. But then that kind of investigation is what we are trying to refer to. Now it can also be seen as a way to think about and know the world. You know? And now this is actually a phrase from Paulo Freire's writing, uh, Pedagogy of Literacy, um, to read and know the read and write the world, basically to know the world, to interpret the world. That's reading. And writing the world would actually mean about, uh, you know, not just interpreting, but be able to make some changes. You know? So mathematics education from that perspective, really. And the assumption, the third assumption is also that there are different mathematical ways to understand the world. And we want our children to gather some of these and become expert, or at least be able to use the mathematical ways to understand and interpret the world. And there are ways of representing information with numbers and other mathematical symbols, because mathematics has its own uh, linguistic discourse and grammar, which also incorporates different symbols and signs, signs for operations, different <laughs> meanings and structures, sorry, for relations, and also for unknown values. And this is what generally emerges in the till about middle school mathematics. Then the fifth point is about using mathematics to know the world and also to rely on mathematical systems of science that can allow us to make those or build those models of the world. You know, for example, a lot is being said and done on mathematical modeling. Mm -hmm. So I'm not actually getting there, but at least in the, even in the middle school level, we have lots of opportunities for creating those models uh, for interpreting the world using mathematics. So these are the general assumptions that we have with mathematics. Now, connecting it with the pedagogic context that we generally have, the purpose of the pedagogy, mathematics pedagogy in school, particularly till about middle school no, level, say, uh, grade eight, is to build conceptual understanding about relationships. Now, relationships between what? Between different manipulatives. The manipulatives that we can refer to, particularly focusing on multiplicative reasoning, if we want to restrict ourselves in that domain, then the manipulatives would be quantities and numbers. You know, these are the generally the, the manipulatives that we use to build conceptual understanding around proportional reasoning and multiplicative reasoning, and generally mathematical reasoning, so to say. Now, in multiplicative reasoning, the manipulatives are often, you know, finding relationships between numbers and quantities or relationship between two quantities. You know, this is how the entire gamut of multiplicative reasoning emerges. The other pedagogic purpose is also to have different, well-defined mathematical processes in place. Now, the word well-defined is a little problematic, although I'm using it, is because these are used in the curricular documents. Now, what happens is that these well-defined processes also act as gatekeepers, you know, to allow some of these processes as formal and textbookish and school type vis-a-vis -vis processes which one can see out of school context, you know, particularly in what we know or call as work context mathematics, workplace mathematics, street mathematics, everyday mathematics, and so on. And often these words are, terminologies are used synonymously to refer to each other you know, interchangeably. The other pedagogic purpose is to build mathematical reasoning, you know, to be able to reason mathematically and that to be able to uh, extend this knowledge on various spatial relations, you know, space and spatial relations. And again, coming back to the objective, some of the objectives of some of the countries at the middle school level is to read and write the world, be able to interpret and make change to the world. But all this, whatever you do, the entire pedagogic purpose is in the gamut of building, uh, math building mathematical development from, <laughs> sorry, from a psychological or cognitive development perspective, from a developmental theory perspective, you know, mathematical development. In that sense. 
Now, what does research say or tell us? Now, the research that I'm trying to or going to refer to mostly will be from, as I said, a group that worked in Oxford University's education department led by Teresina Nunes and uh, Peter Bryant, that group, who were also, Teresina was also the pioneer in uh, street mathematics research in the 80s, and she was one of the really a pioneering researcher to show, to indicate that, look, there is uh, another form of mathematics, which generally, you know, even school going students uh, having out of school context or knowledge or exposure to mathematics would often resort to based on convenient uh, decompositions based on. So these are basically, you know, different forms of mathematics based on same things. All right. So now using that knowledge, then Teresina tries to, you know, in, in fact, in the entire research career of hers, she tries to, she brought in those ideas initially, but then she then tries to connect it with how those could influence or have um, some impact in implications for school mathematics so as to have a better way of understanding what these manipulatives can look like, particularly in unpacking multiplicative reasoning. Now, they have this uh, wonderful book and also a paper on uh, series of papers, though, but some of these are uh, review papers really on multiplicative reasoning. And uh, research, their research indicates mostly that children do not simultaneously recognize all the properties of a concept. All right, so even if we are introducing, say, addition or additive reasoning, many of the gamuts within additive reasoning may not be clear at the first instance, you know. And I'm going to give you some examples soon after this slide to make this point more clear. Then secondly, children also do not learn all the ways in which the concept is expressed. You know, there could be several other uh, methods or meaning making or processes which may not be clear to learners, very, very young learners. And they are in various situations where those can be used and they may not be able to see particularly the unseen problem tasks. And this was not just noticed among very, very young children. In fact, uh, high school students also showed some of these. So problem tasks, which they could solve in their everyday context, when the same problem task was devoid of context and put into just number forms, children could not do. You know, and solve. So, which actually means that they are not able to see the relevance of the concept in various other situations. Therefore, what happens is so, I mean, at the end of it, we can ask, so what? You know, that we know this. I think one of the answers to that question would be that the definition of mathematical concept that is appropriate for a mathematician or, or an adult mathematician or a teacher like us, a teacher educator or a teacher or a researcher like us, may not actually be very appropriate for young learners. So we must understand uh, the, the different ways of developmental stages through which a learner gathers and builds multiplicative reasoning. And that is what I'm trying to do now with this problem task. There are two problem tasks for you. Think about it. And we all know the answers. But let's see what different ways in which learners may be able to do this. And the first one is, let us say Anu has three marbles and she played a game and won four more. So she won four marbles more. How many marbles does she have now? That's the first problem. The second problem is Anu had some marbles. Don't know how much and how many. She played a game and she lost three marbles. And now she has four marbles left. How many marbles did she have before the game? before the game started. All right. Now, uh, if I may have what students of the middle grade school would be thinking and doing it. Yes. You may also respond and turn on your videos and cameras. Have this session more interactive. 
uh, Anindam, your voice is breaking in between. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you this... hear me what I said? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. asking that, you know, this, these are there are two problem tasks in front of your, in, in the screen. And uh, I would like to have some response from you if you unmute and speak, some of you. Will it be possible for some of you to turn on videos? Because then I can see faces and read faces and expressions. Yeah, I can speak. And the first, yeah, the first one is Anu had three marbles and she played a game and won four marbles. How many marbles does she have now? It is just like an additive reasoning. So I have three and I am getting four more, so I am finding the total. But in case of the second one, it is just like an algebraic thinking. So I don't know how much I have, but when I am deducting three, I am getting four. So some unknown part is missing, the unknown part is there, so I don't know. So I'm doing reverse. I'm doing also addition here, but I am starting from the unknown. And But in, in problem one, both the things are given. So I know where to go about and do the additive reasoning to get the answer. But in case of the second one, I, I'm doing some pre-algebraic thinking. That's uh, that's very well formulated answer. Anyone here who'd like to disagree with what Narayana said or would like to add to what he said? Ma'am, the second problem is more thought provoking. Means what? Like we presume uh, something like it's just we take some some imaginary number we are taking, then we are doing mathematical operations is giving more of a room to think over the things. Right, but are, the, are, are, so are these tasks, you know, these two tasks, are they different from each other? Are they the same? Oh, I think uh, they are that both of them are... are uh... Himanjuji, you are saying it's different. Would you explain? Why do you think they are different? I think both are centered around uh, additive thinking. Uh, and uh, it's just that the second task is uh, that you have to take you could, as he said, you could uh, look at it as pre-algebraic because you have to imagine that you have a have had something and you lost uh, whatever three, and you have to get back and uh, try to imagine that what you had uh, in the beginning. So what I also think is that young children, when they start uh, looking at problems like problem two, uh, they find it a little more uh, a little more kind of difficult because they're not used to uh, thinking of mathematics in terms of imagination. That's my experience. Absolutely. And this is precisely what, uh, you know, researchers and we, we claim that, uh, you know, the first one, the first task, which is a, a, you know, a typical addition task, but while the second one is also an addition task, but it's not that typical. You know, one needs to either go to the reverse transformation, which is to, you know, basically apply subtraction, but in a reverse fashion, in a reverse operation of addition, but one can also look at it as a build on task. So I, I have four marbles with me, you know, three were lost, so basically basically going beyond three more, and where do I go? Like, knowledge is being addressed, I've brought one, which is 
generally taken as a uh, Arina, task. I do suggest so you I to switch off your video. Inverse addition task. Right. I do suggest you to switch off your video. Ah, uh, your voice is breaking in between. So if you switch off your video, I think network will be better. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. So uh, now researchers would say, is it better now? Yes, this is better. This is better. What, yeah. uh, better. Okay. Now researchers say that children who are just starting to learn about arithmetic will recognize problem one as addition. But it usually takes two or more years of schooling before they recognize the relevance of addition to problem two. And Teresa and Eunice and Peter Bryant, they have further claimed that therefore children may know something about addition, but they may not yet recognize its relevance to all addition problems for a, for a long time to come, you know, even when they're into algebra sometimes. And we will see more such examples as we move forward. We also see that uh, to understand mathematical concepts developing children's minds through their experience, there are you no know, set of concepts which needs to be taken into account and more, more so from psychological underpinnings. And these are sets, different sets of situation which can make those concepts more useful and meaningful. Not like in Tanzanian textbook talking about you know, speed of a tube and how long it takes to cross a platform and so on, you know, basically distance, speed and distance question using tube, you know, a moving tube, which is essentially drawn from, you know, a, maybe an English textbook from England and uh, using a example of London tube, underground railway system, which for ch Tanzanian children had no sense of. So therefore, the concepts that we are using, the context that we are using must have, make some meaningful context with the set of operational invariants that one need to deal with in these situations. Now, these invariants are often the ones which are problematic for learners. And then the third one is the system of symbolic representations, which includes linguistic, graphical, also gestures, and uh, for representing various invariants, various contexts, and also procedures. Vognod would call some of these actions, including the transformation that we were uh, supposed to have followed in problem two as schema of action. Now, Piagetian, Vagonaut was also very Piagetian in perspective. The Piaget, for Piaget, schema was, you know, the psychological, uh, in a way, psychological manipulatives or acts, actions, which happen to have, you know, series of activities within a plan of action that helped a doer, often children, to, to do a problem task, to get to a solution you know, using certain set of situations. Extending that idea, Vagnot says that, well, we need to have a sequence of sequentially organized series of activities of a certain situation. And let's call that, that's not really a schema. But that's more than a schema, basically associated with an activity. So there could be multiple schema working together, you know, simultaneously and concurrently. So schema of action would give meaning to mathematical science, but the representations within uh, those schema would consist not only of the conventional mathematical science, but can also incorporate other nonverbal uh, you know, acts such as gestures. But also verbal acts such as words or visuals and iconic signs and so on. So it's a it's an amalgamation of both verbal and non-verbal cues, which are used for you know uh, undertaking an activity or series of such organizations of activities. And some of these are not always hands-on; can can also be mental activities, mental schemas of action. Now that takes us to quantities and transformation, because that's, as I said, some of the schemas of action could also be mental. And then dealing with transformation and transformation over quantities can often be <coughs> mental tasks. So quantities can be changed by transformation that we all understand. 
but for many children young children they must also learn that even transformations can change quantities and exactly how the quantities are changed this the second part is often not clear so therefore the first question that was a and a plus b which is 4 plus 7 as 7 4 plus 3 was very clear because that was a straightforward you know quantities to be added and hence transformed but the other one which also required that quantities be changed and a reverse transformation takes place was difficult to handle very young children say age 3 uh, can tell if you add items to a set that it will have more items and if you take away few items from the set then the set will have will be left with fewer items but not only those children but even older ones may not actually understand the reversibility of transformations which often becomes necessary for understanding operations and that is precisely why problem 2 becomes little challenging you know and then we leave it to pre algebraic while it is not really pre algebraic need not always be pre algebraic of course it is but can be actually seen from the same lens as problem 1 but because of this kind of challenges that children often have with regard to transformation this doesn't really work therefore if it becomes really imperative necessary that we distinguish understanding of transformations from understanding operations and that too while analyzing children's mathematical development this become this actually uh, holds more importance from that perspective and therefore additive reasoning which we refer to often as reasoning about addition or subtraction can also be about relation between two arithmetical operations and uh, we will argue later on if i if time permits in this talk or maybe in the next talk that uh, you know that our assumption that a multiplication or multiplicative reasoning is based on series of additive reasonings may not actually work out in fact uh, teresina's group now claims that well understanding of multiplication is basically a parallel process as we uh, do additive reasoning so we build additive reasoning and we build multiplicative reasoning concurrent concurrently and multiplication need not always be seen as a repeated Uh, way to uh, or a repeated addition let's put it directly multiplication did not always be seen or looked into as repeated addition multiplicative reasoning or multiplication can be derived independently of um addition just by merely transforming you know and that transformation is really really crucial this is same as asking you to uh, you know interpret say 10 divided by 2 you know both in quantitative form as well as in the partitive form now 10 divided by 2 can also be seen uh the way we look at it is splitting 10 into two parts you know part of the whole so 10 divided by 2 is dividing 10 into parts straight forward but 10 10 divided by 2 can also be referred to as number of copies of 2 that is there in 10 isn't it so there are five copies of 2 which are there in 10 so 5 twos will make 10 that is one interpretation which leads to repeated addition meaning but then the other one which is which is the uh, quotative meaning splitting into two is not really coming from repeated addition meaning basically so it has an in, independent way of thinking and assuming that when division is really splitting and similarly multiplication is the reverse operation of division so it would be conjoining together juxtaposing together so mean like multiplication by two it not always come from repeatedly adding and so now these are some of the concepts which are which don't uh, come to us very very straightforward in a straightforward manner uh, but and may appear as counter counterintuitive but these are some of the ideas which have emerged lately and we can engage in these ideas all right now uh, what is of crucial importance to us is to have a distinction between quantities and relations between quantities you know because these are the relevant ideas which which are helpful for us to analyze the developmental trajectory of child's mathematical knowledge because as we argued just a while ago that while children may be able to use numbers to solve problems 
especially about quantities, but they still may find difficult to use numbers to solve problems about relations between quantities. Even such as uh, the ones we see in particularly in everyday context, out of school solve similar, exactly the same quantities and transformations, but requiring yeah. your voice is breaking. So I'm not able to hear the last part. What you said. Ali played two games in a series. He won eight. How many points does he have? The distinction between quantities and relations and mathematical knowledge achievement, particularly multiplicative reasoning. You know, the main manipulatives here are the, the relations between quantities. Often we Often children or even the textbooks deal with quantities and numbers. But when it comes to relation between two quantities, particularly the ratio question, you know, or the cost part parameter, you know, we talk about price, but what about cost? You know, uh, for example, which is price per unit, which is essentially a relation between two quantities, often becomes really challenging for children, for learners. So that is what I was trying to say there that uh, you know uh, it's important that we try to make uh, you know learners understand about the relation between two quantities move over and above quantity and a number and so on. Uh, was was i audible no yeah. yeah can you can you just repeat the second one the problem being problem no no i'm, I'm yet to read the second problem Problem A, which is, I don't know why, why the internet is so bad in our campus today. I'm mm -hmm. sitting in the office right now. Oh, carry on, carry on. Very sorry for that. Problem A, Ali played two games in the series and he won eight points in the first game and lost two points in the second game. How many points does he have now? And problem B is, Ali pay, played games in a series that runs over two days. He played some games yesterday. And today he played two games more that count towards his score. Today he won eight points in the first game and lost two points in the second. Does he have more or fewer points now than yesterday? How many more or how many less is the question. Ponder over this and think about it for say a minute. And then tell us whether, whether you think these two problems these two tasks are similar or do you think they are different they are distinct Yeah, would you like to respond as to what did you notice in the second problem? The first one was straightforward. So, uh, if I may, uh, the Emphasis. second problem I, I feel is more about, uh, it's about relations. Uh, not so much as about, uh, you know, addition or subtraction, but it's about finding relations between uh, uh, you know, building a relation between what uh, he, he had before and, and what he has now. So we are comparing something with an unknown quantity and we don't know what that quantity is, but we are only interested in knowing whether that, that something has increased or reduced. Uh, and we're not really looking at, uh, uh, you know, the total number of points he has. So I think these two points in the in a child's thinking or even in my thinking, they would look at, uh, I would look at them as distinct uh, tasks. Yes, they, are, they can be seen as distinct tasks. And also, 
uh, just to add to uh, Aditya ji, what you said, uh, the second problem also needs a little more comprehension skills. It's not that straightforward either. You know the language of it. So yeah. uh, one has to really interpret the problem Haridam. as well. Yeah. I think in the second problem, the second line onwards, he played some games yesterday and today he played two games more that count towards his score. Is it something like an added extra to this question or does it have some kind of relevance? Because afterwards, today he won eight points in the first game and lost two points in the second. That remains same. The only the question part has changed. How many points does he have now asking for the total in the problem A? But in problem B, he's asking about the relationship, whether it is more or less compa uh, comparison of the quantities. But this and is one, an unknown. Unknown. Well. But yeah. why is that? Uh, the, is it like uh, when we are talking about more comprehension skill, the second line of the second problem, does he adding some extra stop into the problem or does it have some more sense? No, no, no. Um, no, it does not, but it's just a language twist. Yeah. yeah. So this is some, it's really, thank you. So Adityji and someone else also pointed out in the chat, I saw. Uh, yes, you know, we must avoid some of these kinds of framings. I deliberately chose this example to discuss with you is also because, look, the task here is not to really deal with language issues. You know, it's more about how you deal with the mathematics behind it, you know, not the not how the child is interpreting, you know. Yes, the second task is distinct, but it also takes into account what the first day score was, which is not told to us, which is unknown. But then the idea here is to give you an example of how the similar looking task can be seen from or, or, or can be transformed to a task between quantities, you know, and not just a number and a quantity, which is the first one, which is similar to a first one. You know, the second one is more of between two quantities. But then in doing so, I think it gave a, a wrong twist, you know, unnecessarily you know, barking on uh, linguistic skills. I remember once in, uh, and that is an anecdotal experience to share, uh, once uh, in one of the university exams on uh, in mathematics, basically applied mathematics and differential equation. The question was uh, state and proof say a, a theorem, state and proof, Sharpie's method for solving partial differential equation, hence or otherwise solve the following differential equation. And most students could not do the second one thinking that it's either or, hence or otherwise. You know, which really actually means that you either you first prove, state and proof Sharpie's method, so some theorem for solving partial differential equation, and either you use the same that result to solve the following differential equation, or you use some other method, but you have to solve both. You know, state and prove as well as solve the given differential equation. Hence or otherwise only means you either use the same result to solve this or use some other theorem to solve this, but you have to solve it. So it's, and in, in fact, the Hindi translation was also very, very peculiar. It said, yatha atva anyatha. So the point is, are we really testing English, testing for the language comprehension or you know, mathematics behind it. This is something which we as teachers, teachers, teacher educators also have to think. And they deliberately I give this task for you. So you understand that, you know, some of these, you know, they are not really straightforward. In fact, the second question is not unambiguous. It's actually quite ambiguous. It actually talks about, it talks about how much uh, Ali, for example, has scored more or less than yesterday. But we don't talk about yesterday at all in the task. So, you know, these kinds of, so in the gamut of trying to make a twist, we often, you know, go into language issues and that may not be really, really mathematical in it and can actually pose different kinds of challenges. And which, and these two have taken from books. You know, it's actually given in a book, used in England. All right, so uh, yeah, that was the point. Two meanings of numbers. I, I, I realize that I'm going very slow. I have to pace up now. Uh, two meanings of numbers often that are essential for us. You know, us means I'm talking to us, my colleagues, teachers, teacher educators, curriculum developers, planners, policy makers. 
Now numbers have representational you know, notion where numbers used to represent quantities and therefore they are representational uh, notions of numbers. These are and then analytical notions which have the numbers have meanings in and of themselves, even not when they are representing quantities. And this meaning is analytic. For example, you know, in a counting string, the seven comes. Now the seven has a place value. You know, it, it's like a, the ordinal number seven. It's like there's an order there. But if you end the, the, the counting string there, then the entire set would have seven objects perhaps. And it could actually tell you the cardinal value as well. But then there's also another meaning attached to it, which is invisible is to say that, well, the seven is basically six, the previous one and one more, like n and n plus one, or the, the previous second penultimate one, and then two more, so five plus two, and so on, or two plus five, you know, the other properties such as distributive, commutative, associative will also come in. So analytic notion of numbers often include not just the representational notion, but it goes beyond you know, the other aspects as well, using the number properties and so on. But in the in context of, you know, dealing with multiplicative reasoning, often these two meanings of numbers are interchangeably used. Now, pedagogic context where two number meanings are often used are in counting and in coordinating different counting principles, using counting to create sets with pre-specified number of elements, like with the cardinal set, which whose cardinality is clear, and using numerical representations to solve problems. This is what generally we give in the textbooks in the exams, and understanding how numbers and quantities are related. This, the fourth one, is often not covered in very, very you know, explicit manner, generally. Like in the same way, how fractions of construct, you know, that fractions can have several meanings. Part whole is one which we often take to or deal with. But there is this ratio concept of a fraction. A fraction can be interpreted as a ratio you know, to numbers, as a quotient of two numbers, as an operator uh, meaning, you know, like half of something or p upon q of, of something, you know, like a fraction of something. And so on. And finally, the measure meaning. Now, both ratio meaning, operator meaning, measure meaning are directly linked with, uh, you know, how numbers and quantities are used or how two quantities can be used and therefore are the building blocks for uh, proportional reasoning and, and eventually multiplicative reasoning. Now, different situations in which uh, different types of quantities can come are where different types of quantities are represented by different types of numbers. For example, comparison between whole and rational numbers that illustrates that although the signs used in number systems may be arbitrary, but the logic of equivalence on order of quantities which are represented in the number system may not be arbitrary. For example, how we deal with, say, a ratio form of rational number, you know, where we are really dealing with, uh, you know, uh, two quantities, you know, differentiation between two quantities, or how two quantities are related. <laughs> or quantities that are represented numerically by relations between two other quantities. Now, I would like you to think of some of these situations here. So the first one is, uh, is about quantities and numbers, and the second one is between quantities. Can you think of some quick examples of such contexts? I hope I was audible. Responding to the chat message, yes, Narayana, yes, we, you can actually make three meanings from them. And the two meanings are given in this slide. Would someone like to quickly cook up an, a, a context or think about a context which aligns with the second one, second interpretation on your slide? Am I audible? Can you all hear me? OK, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for confirming that I'm audible. Would you like to think about some context which fits here, like which which tells you about quantities being represented numerically to indicate to show the relation between two other quantities? you say that uh, things like uh, you know speed or acceleration i mean uh, physical quantities like this are actually there's a number so you say acceleration of gravity is whatever 9.8 uh, but actually it's a uh, it's representing a relation between two different quantities or maybe uh, uh, yeah, two different quantities one a square in case of of acceleration and one is uh, time and the other is uh, absolutely is, uh, Absolutely. But you know what? Aditya uh, you are right, totally right. In fact, the response in the chat box are also correct. You know, someone has written force is mass into acceleration. That is fine. Distance is speed into time. But think of, can you think of a context which also will go well with, say, middle graders, middle school children? But there I can't really talk about acceleration. Yeah. Geetika ji, you gave a good answer. Yeah, number of objects and price. What what would you like to call that? Number of objects and price. You know what that is? That quantity that you generate is what? Cost, cost. Yeah. So Jayshree ji also mentioned it. Yes, it's cost basically. Example is use of weight, unit, kilogram and cost of it. That's right. So basically price per unit, you know, is something which we often deal with. And that is a, a, a very good example of how uh, a quantity can be represented numerically, but actually giving gives a relation between two other quantities. And such, you know, these are situations which we handle all the time, particularly in building ratio concept, in building quotient, in building measure concept of fractions but not often explicitly enough. <laughs> now, here are two contrasting situations, which are interesting for us. Extensive quantities and intensive quantities. Often, extensive quantities are typically measured by part of whole, you know, like units of the quantity of the same quantity, you know. So it would be part of whole, you know. For example, if I want to distribute a chocolate among a number of students, and then it's the part of the chocolate is part of the same chocolate, basically. You know, it's the same quantity that is being dealt with. It. So the quantity of chocolate is measured in units that are themselves a quantity of chocolate, you know, and so on. Similarly, uh, say length, which is measured in units of length, area measured in units of area, volumes measured in units of volume. And so on. These are all, you know, extensive quantities. We are extending that quantities to deal with or to basically explain or uh, use a situation in which that may work. But the intensive quantities, it's like going beyond, really. You know, where it involves a relation between two quant other quantities, such as a ratio. You no, know, intensive quantities are described often by rational numbers. For example, the strength of the taste of a juice you know, made with concentrate and water can be expressed as the ratio of the concentrate to water. You know, how, how juicy, how strong the flavor is depends on the ratio of the concentrate and the water mixed. And so, on. so that would be an intensive quantity. Price or cost is an intensive quantity, by the way, which we just... Again, it is breaking. I was thinking of uh, you know, can't hear anything. Of 
actually asking you to have some more examples of intense quantitative film capability. Yes, force of mass is acceleration, distance between time. All. But can we think of some examples which we have not discussed yet from middle school level? Uh, we lost you in between. So can you go to the previous slide? Somebody has requested for that. I was, I was saying, can we come? Uh, previous slide. Is it better? Uh, no. Uh, so somebody has requested to move to the previous slide. So can we back, go back to the previous slide once again? Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, this one, this one. It's yes, fine, then. Now I was uh, asking, can we think of more examples of intensive quantities? can see one response in the chat box. Thank you. Let's move ahead. Now, let us see this. Where will you put this guy? Problem C. And let us discuss whether it's in intensive or extensive or something else. So Ali and Anu were cycling equally fast around the track. Anu started first. When Anu had completed the circuit nine times, Ali had completed it three times. When Ali had completed it 15 times, how many times had Anu gone around the circuit? That's the question. What kind of relation do you see here between quantities, between number and a quantity, between number and number? Is that intensive, extensive? Yes, there's a relation between them. We are trying to uh, qualify that relation. What would you call it? Is it an example of intensive, extensive? Uh, so in this question, one I have one question I have. So when did Ali start? This is completely missing. So very difficult to even given a ratio like nine is to three and then fifteen is to something because we don't know. He when uh, Onu started earlier. But after how much time, after how many circles, uh, circles on uh, completed, then only started. So that I we can't see a direct relationship between even nine times and three times. So some uh, information is missing in between. So how to uh, solve that part? Okay. No, but he's so, saying uh, that it's uh, equally, you know, they are cycling equally fast. No, fine. So but, that means uh, the initial condition is missing, which is what uh, I think you have to work out. Uh, uh, so it's but again, a re relational problem rather than. So if they're cycling equally, that means, uh, you know, Anu was six laps ahead of Ali. Okay, sorry, sorry. Then I missed that equally fast. Ah, fine, fine, thanks. Is solving it that was not an issue but the thing is that how a child would think of is yeah yeah you mean missing one word 
can turn up up or down someone so you see that this is a task uh, is everyone on the same page because i am only getting response from two people here so i'm not sure if we are all together seems like an intensive quantity distance and speed are related all right vishwajit uh, any other response i want more response it is supposed to be an interactive session by the way i may be wrong here but i don't think there's any ratio involved here and and uh, it's it just it seems to go back to the additive thing that we talked about right in the beginning yeah this is extensive that's... extensive not intensive that is a very good fair that's a fair observation aditya ji yeah it seems because the distance you know the, the what is invariant is to be found out what is invariant here is interesting and that is that six lap difference because they are cycling equally fast and therefore the you know the number of laps that one has covered or both have covered will have the number of laps i'm talking about the number will always have a difference and a uh, 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 an invariant difference because that's not changing because the speed is not changing so therefore since anu started early she has already taken a few laps before ali started and because the speed is same you know you know the difference between ali and anu in terms of number of laps is going to be invariant and uh, and therefore one is tempted to think that this is an additive reasoning task you know no matter what you do ali anu plus so ali plus 6 is anu number of laps and uh, therefore one may actually think that well the answer can actually be 21 you know 21 times and so on. but do you think that this could also be uh, seen as a multiplicative reasoning so the research that we are referring to uh, they sort of claim that you know multiplicative reasoning can have two trajectories one going from additive to multiplicative one going from say proportional reasoning you know different basically what we talk about you know relation between two quantities intensive quantities for example which are often often are uh, rational numbers so those are examples of proportional reasoning generally if the invariant is fixed but here also invariant is fixed but in an additive form and this is also a multiplicative reasoning because here we are dealing with a quantity and a number you know and and this may come as a as counterintuitive because one may only look at it from an additive perspective and nothing to do with multiplication here but multiplicative reasoning is not only about multiplication multiplication it's also about how and how we define or look at the relation between quantities and numbers and here we have a relation between quantity and the number so although this is additive and definitely so because the invariant is fixed invariant it's it's like a plus k is equal to b type of equation a linear equation of that kind where k is constant and no matter what a b b will accordingly change according to a so so uh, this seems to be uh, well extensive but we are not sure it seems to be intensive but we are not sure but it definitely deals with number and quantity and therefore you know so this is a nice example where one really feels challenged by whether this this example is of intensive quantity or extensive quantity so to say we are not very sure can be can be actually seen from both the lenses now therefore for the development of multiplicative reasoning is very becomes very very crucial because the use of symbolic numerical representation often goes beyond manipulatives such as in this case 
or understanding of the necessary and contextual relations that may appear can create situations that are multiplicative in nature. And then learners also develop ability to solve problems in which the very idea of correspondence, one-to-one -one correspondence and ratios must be generated by the problem solver. Here you see that correspondence building up, you know, A and B has one-to-one -one correspondence. This one is B plus one, A plus two is B plus two and so on. So then there is a binary, bi sorry, uh, bijective relation that you can see. Now let us think about this task now and think in what different ways you can come up with an answer. And imagine that you are, you yourself uh, are a young learner. You know, so how many bindi packets can be made out of a collection of 400 bindis when each packet contains 25 bindis? So uh, how many different ways you can come up with the answer is the question. What do you see here? Do you see intensive quantities here or extensive quantities here? Do you see it as a, a division problem? Do you see as an additive problem, you know, as a ratio problem? What kinds of what, what different kinds of interpretations can you come up with? Would anyone like to speak up? I would think that there are many dimensions to it. I mean, one is mm. a straight thing would be just divide, uh, which uh, an adult might probably think that we just divide 425, you get the answer. And uh, a young child might say that, okay, uh, I know that uh, four times 25 is 100, and it's more, more like a unitary problem. So, uh, and these two things are seem to be related. So I, if I have hundreds and how many hundreds are there in 400, then I would say that, okay, there are four uh, hundreds and therefore, you know, I, I arrive at the same thing by, by uh, thinking through a multiplicative process rather than just dividing. Very nice, yeah. In fact, Aditya Ji, were right, exactly. Exactly that's what we, we often, see you know in context which are non school type you know out of school context is to see this relationship between quantities you know so bindi packets and number of bindis so uh, now seeing that well uh, 25 has a nice relation with 100 that it's double and double and double is a very very innate basic human trait doubling and halving and to actually be able to see that, well, it's double of double of 25. That takes me to 100. And then 100 and 100 and 400 are also linked with the same relation as 25 and 100, you know, which is basically double and double, so four times. So yeah, and all together, therefore, it's 16 times. Yeah, Arindam. Or the other way around. You know, it's the, yes. Hello. Uh, what I'm thinking is not. Uh, we are not looking at how the child is solving the problem. This is what kind of strategy the child is using, but we are looking at whether it is extensive or intensive, whether it is a simple division problem or it is a ratio problem. I think we are looking from that direction. We are not looking at what is the strategy the child will use to solve this problem. Am I right? Am I understood? No, Have I, I understood look, the question? No, 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 no. I wanted to look at from the both angles. Okay. I would have discussed the same, what you're saying, mm. I would come there, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so these are the kinds of strategies that one noticed, you know, in, in, in solving such examples. But then when, if we now extend, if was the child really 
playing around since the child is able to play around with the numbers and the quantities and particularly because in out of school context often the number patterns or the number relations are visibly clear than in the formal setup because of you know uh, the situational invariance that one can attach to with numbers and that one sees that well this is double of double or this is half of half or pow and so colloquially speaking one quarter and so on. so those invariants then tempt us you know the researchers may actually think well this may then become really an intensive quantity you know because we are not really looking at part of whole always but you are also looking at invariants and therefore between two quantities a number which deals with two quantities and therefore intensive one can also look at it from an additive basically in extensive quantity because one can see it as pow you know quarter and quarter half and half so a quarter and then again quarter and quarter, half and half so it's quarter of quarter in that way so it becomes extensive now therefore these real life situations are generally intertwined between extensive or intensive and not may not really always be very very straightforward to see, so to say mm. uh, may not be very very distinguishable and need not be so as well now this is only a, an example of how multiplicative reasoning can be theorized mm. but in the practical situation examples such as these are also meeting points where these ideas intensive extensive can meet together mm. and bring an idea together and an amalgamation of both and therefore multiplicative reasoning that which we often think of you know having to derive with multiplication and then as a division task or as a ratio task need not always be so it can also be a task which is purely based on uh, you know convenient grouping and therefore additive in, in nature you know like extensive and so on. <laughs> now using these examples he uh, in the connected learning initiative that we used you know in our context in tiss uh, the mathematics modules on proportional reasoning has uh, several interactive games you know digitally enabled using technology affordances to create a situation where symbolic numeric numerical representation can go beyond manipulatives and create similar situations where one can actually see context from both angles or be able to understand the necessary contextual relation in a multiplicative situation and also the correspondences and i would like to discuss here two examples uh, from the task and I'm, i'm going to share and these examples are scaling task and variation task and i'm going to share this these two links because if you could uh, open these links in your own devices you would be able to see what i'm trying to say because i would like to keep some time for our discussion now the first it's very easy it's clicks oer.tss.edu/home/elibrary and these oer are open educational resource they are free to use and free as in free of cost but also free as in freedom where you have uh, you know you are free to use ad adopt adapt but yes acknowledge and then oh. use in your context so uh, these you are really open educational resource in their context uh, and these are available on the clicks platform on this website uh, freely downloadable and you can also see that these are there are not just these you know mathematical modules but there are also modules on science on uh, communicative english or as also on astronomy which is often not taught in school science subject all right so uh, sorry you narayana please, you wanted ha uh, can you send the link in the chat box it will be easier for us to open okay. and we can save it here and it's a pdf so it's let me see okay yes i can This is one. The entire library is there for you, and this is the one which has the 
variation task. Uh, we'll see the second one. Am I right? Yes, you can see the second one and also look for the scaling task. Let me just explain. Um, now in the scaling task, uh, I'll just take a minute and explain and leave it to you. Uh, you know, often we do not do scaling in school, uh, you know, particularly on proportional reasoning. Uh, this is to basically understand how one would look See, we always do comparison tasks, <laughs> but then to imagine how a small object, if scaled up, you know, in all the dimensions, you know, if it is a two dimensional object in all, both the dimensional, three dimensional object, all the dimensions, three dimensions, then what changes and what remains invariant? How does it look like? You know, that kind of a task it is. Now, where do we, what do we see here, you know, in terms of reasoning, multiplicative reasoning? You know, it's, it's something that may not be very, very intuitive always, particularly when you go to three dimensions. And to even to talk about, say, a cube, you know, say you draw a cube of three by three, like three centimeter by three centimeter, and having one centimeter squared in between, you know, so basically nine centimeters squared, so nine cubes put together. If I now if I now scale it by three, you know, how will it look like? And if the center, suppose, was colored by a color, say red, and all other colors are green, how would the center look like in the scaled figure? How many cubes will there be? You know, these kinds of questions, these kind of, you know, basically, yes, it's manipulatives, but also making correspondences. And therefore, you know, uh, really engaging with intensive quantities and extensive quantities both. That's one. The variation task is similar. It's basically you have a glass of water and then there are ice cubes. How many ice cubes do you really need to bring water to the brim of the glass? And if you change the size of the ice cube, you know, then what happens to the volume? Basically area, volume and volume, but then it's again a scaling task in that sense variation task. So what in what is varying and what remains invariant is something that we can think of and ask. So these are some of the you know hands-on activities that we have created and which we think can actually lead to more meaning making because it's helps us to use the manipulatives hands-on but also to keep in mind the uh, you know multiplicative situations and correspondences and ratios. I will stop here and uh, wait for uh, some of your questions and insight sharing. I'm sure many of you must be having more insights from practice, from the field, and it would be very, very interesting and encouraging to hear from the some of the practitioners' voices. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yes, Abhiji. Uh, so, I, you know, most of the research that I've gone through and, and probably what we've seen now and the examples we've seen uh, more so, uh, they relate to uh, learning at early stage or middle school stage at the most. And uh, you mean uh, in, no, this just one, uh, well, in this topic area? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, uh, the whole thing about numbers and about uh, you know, extensive and extensive, and uh, as we talked about, you, you just mentioned uh, scale and, and variations. Uh, now, actually, the same things can also be transferred. I, I think they can be translated to higher grades. Whether you're talking about, uh, you know, Pythagorean uh, sort of triplets, or you're talking about uh, trigonometric ratios, so. Uh, I was just wondering uh, that you know a lot of research happens at at the uh, uh, elementary stage. Uh, 
I have not come across much research which which looks at uh, mathematical learning or or concept forming at uh, later stages. Yeah, I may be wrong, so I just I want to be educated on that. <laughs> no, 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 Aditya, you were right. You know that is also because in our country, India, you know, the mathematics education research is not new. You know, it's, it's has been happening in various pockets, various domains, various groups, uh, both systematically but also you know informally, and we have so far remained very, very you know stuck to till about elementary grade, you know, dealing with mainly you know numbers, number concept, whole number arithmetic, fractions, rational numbers, then geometry, measurement on one, mensuration on one side, but then also looking at transition from arithmetic to algebra. And you are right that you know we have not had much scope or research in the secondary school mathematics or even college level, early college level mathematics. There are, say, a, you know, calculus education or so on and so forth, but yeah, not much. You're right. And that is also a trend internationally speaking as well. Although things are changing now, I mean, there are more groups. You see, we have to understand that you know, this is also a very small group you know, of researchers, of us. You know, uh, both nationally and internationally, it's not a big group. And uh, and systematically speaking, I mean, I, I'm just speaking about systematic research. <coughs> there are also not many universities which offer degrees in mathematics education in India or mathematics education research in, in India, say at the levels of masters and PhD. And therefore, we do not have that critical mass to you know to have this continuity from going from middle school to high school and so on. But yes, some of uh, work, my colleagues also have shown interest. Our work in geometry has been in the, at the secondary stage, but you are also right that we don't see much in trigonometry research, for example, and so on. Yes, but I think we are also coming up, you know, like in statistics probability, we see it nowadays more of such calculus, yes, but not yet much on uh, quadratic equation, binomial theorem yes whatever we have is limited to students misconception and error analysis but really get engaging with the content of how you know uh, the understanding of the comprehension builds and breaking those to like as we did here has not happened you're right thank you <laughs> Arindam, there is one question in chat box I am going to yes, yes, uh, Gitika's question. What else can be done to make students understand the word problems apart from comprehension skills? That's one. And the second is also students face problem in geometry. What can be done the same? Well, for the second part, yes, you are right, Gitika ji. Uh, geometry, although it's there are a couple of reasons. Although one looks at geometry as something very hands-on and therefore, uh, you know, can be easily conveyable or conceivable, but often that's the hard spot. Probably because it's taught almost at the end of the academic year and rushed through in the syllabus. Mm, but, uh, and we see that, that uh, in fact, in our work, our research also indicates that even nine graders are often found to be in, at the level where uh, say a fourth grader or third grader should be. So if you are, more interested in Gitigaji, more interested in this kind of research, refer to our geometric reasoning, Lix geometric reasoning module, and also to Van Healy models of geometric reasoning developmental stages, you know, where we, you know, they actually indicate how it's there are different stages like visualization and analysis, abstraction and rigor, deduction and rigor, and so on. So those stages are there, but yes, you know, some of uh, these problems are very, very Acute, in fact, and yeah. But uh, with regard to your first question, the how to make students understand the word problems better, it's. I think it's important that we give them more contexts, more context and informal expression of those contexts, not very very formalized wording of the problem, because as we all understand, the objective is is not to make them not to see their linguistic capability language capabilities but 
their interpretation capabilities. And therefore, if we are able to give or cook up or come up with contexts which are very, very familiar with children and their everyday life, or maybe a general context in the class, uh, makes more sense. In fact, that works better. That's what research also indicates. Do you suggest uh, some in emerging educational problem areas to be researched upon? Which area, Himangiji? Himanguji. Which area of work? I mean, that would make me. So, if, uh, if you're talking about mathematics education, then a lot is happening in this area on, uh, say, curriculum comparison. You know, uh, assessment is a big issue. You know, talk of the day, actually. Assessment, curriculum textbook analysis, and also conceptual development on various topic areas. These are some of the educational problem areas really one can think of. You know, and then when I talk about content, then everything is all covered. No, as in, no, actually you're right, Adityji, the way geometry, and in fact, the entire mathematics, the way mathematics has evolved, we actually teach is completely in the reverse direction. So forget about Euclid's elements. We are not even we are not even reaching close to Hall and Stephen's book. It's uh, quite dilute, but also that you know, conceptual understanding is not building up. Yeah. But thank you very much for joining. In fact, I would have liked more participation and more, but then I also spoke for long. But if someone else, you know, those who have not spoken or written, can come up with some other ideas or insights. I think uh, you I can stop welcome. sharing the screen. Stop sharing the screen. So you will have more visibility. Yeah, thanks. Well, we have come to the... Come to end to this uh, thank you very much for joining and hope uh, you will be able to use some of these resources open educational resources for your purposes adopt and adapt thank you and over to you Vinay uh, thank you very much uh, Dr. Arindam for discussing on very crucial uh, topic intensive quantities provides a foundation for understanding ratios and top uh, proportions and uh, participants, uh, uh, we are very thankful to you for engaging uh, this session for asking questions and discussing on this topic. So I think uh, we have uh, put it our session here. I'm again thankful to all of you from Synergy team. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thanks.